Welcome, everyone. And in response to complaints about the overlong nature of my intros, I've kept it short this week. Real Vision Defiant, Kami Elaine Lee, and me, Pars Crypto Stories. And yes, that was a haiku. Welcome, Kami. Welcome, Elaine. How are you doing, both of you? Hey, Robin. <laughs> um, I think we should go back to the long intros for next time, but we'll give you a pass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you see, yeah. You see, I just, I stood up here bare my soul in pure poetic verse and then you just stamp all over me. <laughs> this is the true nature of our relationship. You the boss, me the humble employee. <laughs> yes, but uh, casting all humility aside, let's talk about the big soiree pageant event that was the Super Bowl when crypto companies came out in force and said, here we are to the world. But what did you see from that? What was the response and how did it all go down? Elaine, I know you wanted to uh, talk about this one. Oh, yeah, I'm taking this one on. So Los Angeles Rams and Cincinnati Bengals. Yeah, like, look, do I understand the game? 100% no. Was I on crypto Twitter watching the live commentary? 100% yes. Um, look, for me, I just think you saw two Board 8 Yacht Club holders performing on stage. Eminem owns one, Snoop Dogg owns one, and the whole world was sort of, the crypto world was sort of watching on Twitter going, go on, you're going to throw your ape out there at some point. But no, they didn't. It was fully concentrated on the music, which I um, absolutely loved. But the thing is, for me, I think um, it was the Larry David commercial with FTX. I think that was just pure comedy gold. I think it struck a chord with all of us because if you missed it, the whole sentiment around it was don't miss out. And I thought that was brilliant. You know, people like us, we do crypto every day, but this hits right here. You know, the whole don't miss out sentiment. We have that conversations with friends and family. And that's what FTX played on that. And, you know, when you sort of watch this from the sofa, you sort of sit back and go, well, how much money was actually pumped in to make this sort of um, advert? and actually have some facts and figures for you today. Um, I read a New York Times piece, you know, they had to follow strict COVID-19 protocol that was in place. Um, they filmed this during the surge of Omicron. It was 100,000 a day follow it, that cost to follow these COVID protocols. And it was 112 actors and a hunt for 134 crew members. I mean, those are just figures that are just out of this world. And the head of marketing at FTX go, it's not that surprising that a bunch of crypto uh, guys decided that it's a risk worth taking. So, Cami, one of the big themes of this episode is going to be optics, the image that we present to the world. It's something that we're going to have to be more and more mindful of. Do you have any thoughts around the way this looked to the muggles out there? I think, you know, beyond the content of the ads themselves, I think that the fact of having... Um, how many were there like like at least four different crypto companies advertising on the Super Bowl with ads that uh, run for at least six point five million dollars per 30 seconds? Um, it's just like a staggering amount of money and it just communicates to the world that uh, crypto is big. It's here. It's, you know, not going anywhere. Um, so it's just uh, the the message is we're here to make a big splash and to get noticed. And I think that goal was um, definitely achieved. So we, we had eToro, we had Crypto.com. Crypto.com has pretty much been everywhere. Uh, UFC, Formula One. We then had this FTX spot with Larry David. It, what people don't really appreciate about shooting commercials, and I, I have shot commercials, is they are very expensive. Everything is accounted for. This is how rental companies, this is how ad agencies make their money. This is big business stuff. And then a Super Bowl commercial is what it is. And Larry David doesn't come cheap, let's be honest. So I think what people don't understand about commercials is that they they really do cost a lot of money. And it's, you know, we can get results here at the studio using the cameras that we use. They look very, very good. But the thing about TV ads is you have to control every single piece of the process. Every single thing you see on screen was put there by a human and that human has to be paid. And so just having that level of control for something that is tightly scripted and has Larry David, who's a huge star in it, that's going to cost money. But I want to pick up on something you said, Elaine, which was you pointed out there were two people on stage who have bored apes. But that's not the only thing that they own. They also own cars. They also own houses. We don't talk about them in terms of the cars that they drive. Snoop drives a Tesla. You don't go, oh, there's Snoop on stage. He drives a Tesla. Why is it that we say, well, there's Snoop on stage. He owns a bored ape, by the way. Why is that important? 
I mean, me being so, you know, across what people's profile pictures are on Twitter, it's a brand. You're seeing the brand that these two mega superstars are carrying and naturally watching what is meant to be dubbed as the crypto bowl. And you're seeing like the undercurrent magic of, you know, the adoption of cryptocurrency right on the stage of Super Bowl. These two big, powerful musicians, musicians, <laughs> yes, musicians, are board eight yacht club holders. And I think that's what's um, what's fascinating for me to see that, you know, board eight yacht club ho- uh, owners are, they're no longer being bought or moved across from transaction to transaction, to transaction from, you know, a, a normal person, like, you know, someone who's their first NFT expenditure. It's it's celebrities who's buying them. It, it's it's brands who are buying them. It's big companies and venture capital companies just hoarding them up. So I think you just got to look at the massive, you know, amount of cost that you're seeing on this Super Bowl stage. Yeah, but I, I see that as a problem. Do you not optically, ethically? I mean, Kami, I, I, there's no right answer to this, but where, where do you sit on this? Does it does it trouble you at all? You mean like the, the staggering amounts of money that are being spent on JPEGs? Yeah, and the message it sends out, which is like, mm. as, as Elaine said, this is big companies hoarding these things. This celebrities mm. who have lots of money buying these things, the status symbols. It's a it's a slightly odd fit with a a space which says it's for the people, which is democratic, which is open to all and permissionless, which we are. Mm. I feel like there's a disconnect there. Yeah, it it is a bit kind of there is conflict and tension there. Um, in the end, I think. Uh, crypto and blockchains are a technology and they're tools um, and they're the fact that they're open means that they can be used for many different things um, so I think there there is space for um, applications and the use cases that are open to everyone uh, within NFTs themselves you you will have collections that uh, are more accessible and that you don't need to be a millionaire to to own and access um, the Infinite Machine Collection is one of them. <clears throat> Ahem. Um, <laughs> not subtle Wait, job funny. there. Um, um, and then you have others where, you know, you do need to be a millionaire to be uh, a part of the club. Um, I think, you know, that's just the nature of free markets. Um, and I think um, I think it's, it's you know, it, it's, it's signaling that you are kind of in the know, uh, that you're part of a club. And I, I think it, it's, it's pretty amazing that uh, these huge celebrities are willing to, uh, to spend that, that much money or, or just a signal that, that they want to be a part of this club. Um, it, it is a sign that, okay, like crypto is cool, at least for like some in some sectors. I know how hated it is in other sectors, but you know, for some people it is worth it um, and, and they, they do want to belong. Well, there is a there's an undeniable connecting thread through all of this, which is manager Guy Osiri, former Madonna manager, who signed up the Board at Yacht Club. And it was no coincidence that we saw MoonPay getting NFTs into the hands of significant celebrities. There was just this painful, painful kind of insert at the beginning of a Post Malone video where he's on his phone like looking at a board ape, it is so shockingly painful. And then you have this moment with Paris Hilton and Jimmy Fallon. He's just like, I think we can do this better. But you know, like I, I we're stumbling that. through I it. That. And like it's not it's not like I'm hating on NFTs here, but there's just there's so many things where you just think, I don't quite know if I like the message this is sending out. Look, it's hard for to can like you know when the Jimmy Fallon and NFT had the, J- Jimmy Fallon and Paris Hilton had their moment like sharing the what their board apes looked like. I mean that was an issue for the people in the crowd, the audience, the people, the crew members, and they were like, "What the hell are they two them two talking about?" But look, these super brands at the end of the day was built by the community, I assume so, or definitely you know mobilized by the people who bought in in the first place. So I think you know it it's down to these. Uh, projects you still want to call them or companies as however they function you call these projects these nfts it, it i think you know if they're responsible enough they should go back and sort of you know ask the question how do we bring more people into this community now you know what's the next step to to make people to welcome people 
more back in. You know, I know Ball at Yacht Club has something you can buy fractions of. World of Women, who I was speaking to, is probably thinking about another part of its collection. So I think it is really down to the brands and their community within themselves. Like, let's have a real conversation about how to bring more people in. Well, actually, I'm going to go back to a point you made, though, which is when you said whatever we call them. I think it's incredibly important that we specify what we call them because you do have a company in the shape of Yuga Labs that is mm. that is managing some piece of what the Board Ape brand is. And then there's the Board Apes themselves. That is a very important distinction. It's something we're going to pick up later on when we talk about Dinos. Um, but I actually want wow. to move on now to just a, it's a little segue with the Coinbase it aired an ad during the Super Bowl, and actually, once that had aired, they had to throttle traffic for a few minutes on the site. And Coinbase is notorious for going down when you lean it the most, which is when the market is dumping. Coinbase invariably uh, goes out, but in this case, it seems to be because the advertising actually worked. And Coinbase is on this massive growth surge at the moment, massive headline. They're going to hire 2,000 employees in 2022, citing quote unquote enormous opportunities in Web3. Cammy, what do you make of that? Yeah, I had to do like a double take when when uh, I first learned about uh, like about this, like 2,000, 2000 new employees on Coinbase. Like, it's just mind boggling. Um, yeah, um, you know, it, it, it kind of goes hand in hand with what we were saying about the, the Super Bowl ads. You know, it's like these these companies are not just like some scrappy upstarts anymore. Uh, the companies leading at, at the front of crypto, they are forces to be reckoned with. You know, they they're here. They made a huge splash at the Super Bowl. They're they're hire, hiring thousands of people. Um, Coinbase is is now a public company trading on like U.S. exchanges. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it it you know like it doesn't get more mainstream than that. Uh, I think this is what kind of we are. We are um, we're seeing and it's and it's becoming more and more clear uh, in crypto. There there was always this question of like when will this become mainstream? And I think you know this is just like one more example that it it really already has. Well, there's some staggering statistics on the Coinbase website: 73 million verified users, but 2,700 existing employees right now. So they're wow. pretty much about to double in 2022. Now, there's a risk that you grow too fast, but when I see those kind of numbers, that's sort of reminiscent of how rapidly Facebook grew when it was in its massive growth phase. Something is happening here. Interestingly enough, I actually got a message from the KYC department at Coinbase today saying I needed to send them some information. And good Lord, was it a lot of information. They wanted additional details around my current or previous occupation. They wanted pay slips. They wanted um, any kind of human resource department uh, documentation. They wanted to confirm the source of any funds I put into Coinbase. They wanted to know where any, any source of wealth, including um, un Your NFTs. Specif yeah, they wanted to know my wallet transactions. So screenshots of oh, transactions wow. from an unhosted wallet. Good and Lord. they wanted three months worth of bank statements issued within the last four months. I was like, are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> what is going on here? So I, I went to their about page where they said why they wanted to have this information. And it says, why does Coinbase need this information? We asked for this information as a security measure to ensure our customers, to ensure our customers have a safe and secure experience. It helps prevent fraud and increases account security. So clearly something is going on here. And this is also from the UK, by the way. So the UK is doing some things slightly differently to the, to the rest of the world. But like what? Th this is nothing to do with my own personal safety and security. This is all about compliance. Like, but that is a lot of information to be asking me. Um, so, Cami, I'm, I'm just curious whether you have any thoughts around this because generally on this side of the pond, we don't have to deal with this. In the US, I think it's slightly different, but I was fairly hefty. I was genuinely shocked when that came through. Yeah, no, um, I had no idea they they were asking for all that uh, information. Well, you know, it it. It goes in line with what we're seeing, uh, with, with, with what we've been seeing for a while, which is, you know, increased uh, regulatory oversight in, in the cryptocurrency industry. And, um, you know, crypto is getting bigger, as we've mentioned. And so it, you know, regulators are, are paying closer attention to the space. And um, 
And of course, uh, you know, they are they're requiring all this information from the, the biggest uh, crypto exchanges uh, like like Coinbase. Um, and I think, you know, that that was clear this week with with BlockFi and uh, and the settlement that they had to uh, pay uh, with for for the SEC for its lending uh, product. Coinbase had to do the same uh, or, or not do the same, but they also had had a issues with with their own lending offering um remember the the sec last september came out and, and told them uh, that they were going to sue them if they put out their lending product so they had to kind of step step back um and now of course uh, they, they're probably being pressured to have all this information from uh, they're pressured by regulators to have all this information about their users um and you know in, in the end yeah it, it's it's all about um preventing money laundering um and uh, just like illicit activity happening uh, with crypto so it's more for their protection than our protection of course uh, as always um same thing with lending like um you know when i was like reading over the the blockfi uh, news and and statements it was like, oh yeah, we're we we want to protect BlockFi users from 10% interest rates, and it's like, um, <laughs> well, I'm not sure about that. Um, do they do they really? I mean, one of the, the the narratives that's been popping out recently has been the willingness of law enforcement or regulators to to come ahead, come forward, and say, we know how to track you, we know how to find you, you cannot hide from us. In the UK, they seized NFTs in a, in a fraud probe, um, looking for digital assets. I mean, the, the amount they seized wasn't that valuable, but the, um, the UK, the HMRC, which is um, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, they have been seizing these things. And I, I think the UK is acting tough on Bitcoin blockchain in general. But from the US as well, we hear the same kind of narrative, which is we're getting tough and you cannot escape us. But that, that BlockFi story is interesting. So BlockFi had to pay... $100 million in a settlement with the SEC. Half of that goes to the SEC and half of that goes to state regulators. And it is exactly that. It's about high yield accounts. So they had a lending product. You could uh, deposit assets and you would be paid um, up to around 9.5%, which is not stellar, but it's a great deal more than you would get depositing assets in a bank account. And there's so many implications to this. Um, Elaine, do you have any thoughts about it? Yeah, look, I think this story was uh, first reported uh, by Axios, which for me is interesting because Axios itself is an outlet that does excellent political reporting. And I think coming from Axios, it just tells us that, it, you know, DC can't be dismissive of the rise of digital assets. OK, so, you know, the um, BlockFi is a crypto startup. OK, like you said, they agreed to pay 100 million to set out allegations on the SEC. There's two things massively for me that stood out for for this and why this is significant is that it was the largest ever penalty um, against a cryptocurrency firm. This is from Naxius um, reporting that I read, uh, that I've read, and the first in which crypto company was charged with violating the registration provisions of the Investment Company Act of 1940. Okay, fine. So, you know, this Investment Company Act of 1940 what this tells us is basically it's a piece of legislation that now crypto companies have to, you know, gain the momentum of studying and now has to study up and be like, well, WTF, what the hell does this all entail? But um, BlockFi has responded as well. And the company said, you know, it's been hoping for increased regulatory clarity and that today's solution, because they did pay them, it means the company is leading uh, the creation of new regulatory um, landscape for crypto. So I think the, the big worry um, is you know, within the crypto community is, well, who will the SEC come after next? But, you know, if they keep doing it, what is the black and white rules uh, for companies like uh, BlockFi should follow? And all of us know that, you know, tech is king, tech is going to grow. So these crypto companies will hopefully adapt to whatever um, legislation that's going to come out and find these companies to do the relevant things. Cami, <laughs> I see your hands up. Yeah, so um, I, I wanted to add to the, the BlockFi P 
piece. So uh, Brady Dale of The Defiant had um, an interesting angle on, on this story that I haven't uh, really seen reported elsewhere, and that he dug into kind of the reason, the real reason why the, the SEC went after this specific product for BlockFi. And it was because BlockFi wasn't representing to, to users the risks that these um, deposits and lending rates entailed. So BlockFi was um, uh, claiming that uh, most of their lending positions were uh, over collateralized. Um, and apparently that was not really the case. Uh, you know, in, in DeFi, um, uh, loans uh, require uh, uh, over, like putting up uh, more, uh, more collateral than what the loan is worth. So they're all over collateralized or most of them by design, like the, the, the loan just like simply doesn't work. Like the smart contract is set up that way in CFI. So like cent like centralized crypto uh, finance, um, like, like BlockFi. Uh, BlockFi is a centralized entity which connects borrowers and, and lenders. And apparently what BlockFi had been doing was it had been lowering its collateralization requirement over time. So it turned out that now uh, loans were not over collateralized any longer. So that represented a high risk. Like uh, th there was some figure so um, over like the rate of over collateralization from BlockFi's institutional borrowers have have has been falling from 24% to 17%. Um, so that means that there is a, a much kind of a lower uh, like safety uh, like a, the, like the safety net has has become a lot more fragile for for lenders. Um, so. You know, I, I think that's um, that's an interesting point. Like the the reason why the SEC came after this is because like BlockFi wasn't clear about the risk, um, and I think you know that's something to note uh, for DeFi because in DeFi, uh, all of that is transparent. You know, uh, in when you're dealing with with BlockFi, there's no way for users to actually go and check BlockFi's account and see. What the collateralization ratio is for their loans or they're just trusting um, a company an organization with their funds um, that's kind of the difference with DeFi, where people uh, are able to just like see everything on chain everything is more transparent um, and you know loans are usually way over collateralized well there's there's so many interesting components to this the the main one being that the one of the arguments put forward by the crypto companies was that banks don't have to be um, set up as securities offerings if they if they generate interest on deposits, whereas that's exactly what's being asked of these crypto companies. So there's a separation there. The a bank will typically pay you around 0.05% or something on deposits. So a huge amount of the yield that they generate from lending out assets doesn't come back to the customer, whereas in this case, it actually does a huge amount of the yield that's generated by a BlockFi account should in theory or at least was coming back to um, the consumers what, what's also interesting is the BlockFi's response to this is to create a security compliant offering called BlockFi yield which the idea is that this will open up um, this product to bigger institutions and bigger players who can come in with some crystal clear regulation around it and say okay cool we, we can we can use this product because it's regulated of course that means that the the common man cannot, at least the common man in the US cannot, because they will not be considered a sophisticated investor uh, able to take advantage of that. So they're kind of screwed. And what's more interesting is that the the SEC's position on DeFi is very clear now. They call most DeFi protocols DINOs, as in decentralized in name only, and they will be coming for them. I think that's pretty clear now. So there's going to have to be some soul searching in DeFi protocols, whether they want to continue and fight the fight or just capitulate and run away. But there's also a degree to which I think in the past, for instance, Ripple just paid the fine. EOS just paid the fine. 100 million, you're starting to get to the territory where you're like, oh, that's not a lot of money. And that seems to be the message here that they, the fines are getting steeper because it was just simply too easy for companies to pay the fine and just continue operating. Uh, even though they've done, you know, what they've done. So here, it's definitely a statement moment, and I think we're going to see more of that. 
Um, but, you know, however you look at it, regulatory clarity, whether you agree with it or not, is probably net a good thing. But I just feel like so many of the things that we're sort of about, which is opening up access, it's being slowly closed off bit by bit, bit by bit, bit by bit, until we have exactly the same system that we had before. And that is, that's not so nice to see. So uh, that is the uh, BlockFi story. Elaine, do you have anything to add on that one before we move on to the next topic? That was quick. I wanted to go back and jump back into the Coinbase one. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Well, what did you want to jump into about Coinbase? Well, just a little bit extra about like why you had to go through so many different steps because I had a little quick glance um, at Coinbase blog or press statement bit this morning or however you want to call it. So, you know, so they're growing their um, thing by 2000 employees. But I think um, the the press statement that, that they called it how Coinbase plans to scale globally um, is why you probably have to jump through so many hoops is because they are literally bringing on people. They so this guy called Nana Murugasan, I hope I pronounced that right. And he's the VP of international business development who's joined Coinbase like a month ago. And his job is simply just to make Coinbase take over the world. Um, I popped into their job listing, uh, looking at the international operations and they want to basically leave no face of the earth unturned. They're looking for people in the Americas, Latin America, APAC, Southeast Asia, um, and EMEA. And I just think the whole deal is that they're aware that billions of people are still, um, you know, unbanked or underbanked. And like you, you said earlier on, before we started the recording, is the sheer scale of it, doubling its company size across the world is something, a, a scale that is incomparable to Facebook. And that's all I wanted to add for that one. <laughs> well, the Defiant talks about decentralized finance. Coinbase is a centralized exchange. I see this. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't like it. <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> I don't. I don't. It feels so reminiscent of the, right. of the of the early 2000s, just rapid expansion and one yeah. major kind of shark powered by VCs just gobbling up the entire world and blanketing us with its presence because network effects. I just, I just, I don't know, my experience in crypto and DeFi and DAOs and everything else, micro communities are where the real value lies. And if you have this kind of just behemoth hoovering up everything, it just feels like, oh, it's the same old crap again I know, and I again know. And, they, and again. And you know what? They haven't even launched their NFT place. I feel like every time I join you guys on this show, I see them making a lot of noise. But is that Coinbase NFT marketplace coming yet? <laughs> I'll I tell you what they did do. Followed me on Twitter. Coinbase NFT followed this guy because they know where it's at. Talk about NFTs. Crypto Punk number 5,822. It's a blue alien with a blue bandana. 8,000 right. ETH. 23.7 million US dollars. And no, it wasn't a wash trade. And no, it wasn't money laundering. This was a real trade. Deepak Thapdial, uh, the CEO of Chain, a blockchain uh, infrastructure company, bought a punk for $23.7 million. And my mind boggled. Cami, thoughts? Uh, it, it's it's so hard to to understand kind of what, what's going on here. Like... <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why spend so much money on, on a crypto bank? Um, I mean, it makes a statement. It The statement is, I have a lot of money and, <laughs> you know, um, I want to kind of, you know, like a signal to the world that I'm part of this club. Um, again, like it's, it's about status. It's about belonging to this very exclusive club. Um, yeah. I don't like look so when you know when you sort of ask yourself hey paying 7 million for 30 seconds on NBC for a crypto ad is worth it or not I mean touching this wet fart of a story I just think some rich CEO of some chain company buys a punk for a lot of money his current profile picture is also of a board at Yacht Club with laser eyes and a spacesuit and then he tweets out like two hands shaking and the statement is something like punk meets ape or whatever and i just think what you're going to declare peace with apes and punks i just think it's like move on <laughs> so so the, there's a defi angle to this which is 
the way that he financed the acquisition using compound finance which is a borrowing and lending platform um, oh. to do it so that that was kind of an interesting piece did you did you catch that piece of it cami um yeah i i think you know it's it's kind of nfts uh meets defi um and and it is an interesting piece that it, it, like uh, this uh this guy deepak used compound to finance his crypto bank uh, sale it's it, it's just like all all very um all very cyberpunk um and yeah i mean we'll we'll see kind of more of this intermingling of uh, nfts and defi uh, we we've talked about it a lot in in the defiant you know how um nfts uh, are are starting to become collateral for for loans as well uh, so they you know this digital asset is is uh, becoming productive in defi um and by the same token um uh, defi is is being leveraged itself to to buy uh crypto crypto punks um so what's interesting is like this is all happening outside of uh, traditional finance you know like nfts uh, are a, a, a um, very kind of web3 native phenomenon that couldn't happen on on web2 uh, DeFi is uh, you know all kind of on-chain finance um so like this entire story like this entire transaction happened in using primitives that you know just like weren't available a year a year ago uh, or two years ago um i think that's 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 pretty cool and i think like just like going back to yeah like linking this to the the super bowl um it is yeah it is like a status symbol but it's also an ad right like we're, we're talking about him uh, and yeah. we're talking about deepak we're talking about chain like i had no idea who this guy was um maybe had heard of chain um so if you think about it, you know, maybe it was worth it. I don't know how many uh, clicks this news has brought him. Like everyone covered it. Uh, everyone now know, knows his name. So, you know, maybe it's it, it has like more utility than uh, than just being a PFP. It, it is like a huge billboard. Well, that's a, that's a really interesting point. So this alien is there are only nine of them. They're super, super rare in the, in the CryptoPunks ecosystem. So if you value punks, this is really about as punky as it gets. <laughs> Deepak himself, my first reaction to this was, dude, like, because I read up on him and he was all about social impact and making an, a difference to the world through blockchain. And like, my instant reaction was, if you want to make a difference to the world, why don't you spend that money on educating teachers in places that need them or building houses? I mean, just for instance, I mean, because I think if you add up everything he spent on NFTs, it's probably around 100 million. But like just on the the major M3 mutant and uh, the serum, and then the punk itself, he's around 31 million in, and that's not chump change. That is that's an enormous amount of money that could power an entire blockchain startup for you know three or four years. So what is his what is his deal? Like I and I wanted to hate him. I, I really wanted to kind of think this guy this guy's so an sure. ass. I think I wanted to call this guy an absolute a-hole because like, what's he doing? I've, I went back and I looked at some interviews with him. He's really articulate, really smart. Uh, his company chain was one of the real big kind of success stories in blockchain in a time when there weren't that many. They worked with Visa, they were bought by Stella. He then bought them back. Um, but you're absolutely right, Cami. like in a Forbes article from like two days ago, he talks about what you need to succeed. And one of them is make visibility a top priority. It's literally written here. And he says, visibility and marketing have not been a strong suit for many newer tech companies as they tend to find it challenging to inspire curiosity about their brand. Deepak, job done. Job done. <laughs> Robin, should, should we buy a crypto bank at the Defiant and get everyone talking? <laughs> Sure. Yeah, yeah. It's a way to go. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just dig out that twenty-three million I've got under my, <laughs> on my desk. Yeah, yeah, sure. You heard it here first. But yeah, I thought this was I, really I, interesting because my instant reaction was, was so like, "You're, a, you're a dick." But then I went, "You know what? You're a Deepak." <laughs> I, I think it's more of a social experiment rather than social impact. If he goes on and he actually uses that to create social impact, then bravo. But like, I, I was rapidly i wanted to dismiss him but then i i went further and actually i couldn't so you know there you go and you know what it's very very easy to dismiss us because this is coming to the end of our show but as we go there 
Cami, have you any last words for us? Um, any last words? Uh, you know, I think this is I mean, everything about this show. It's just about crypto making a splash. Um, you know, the, this crypto punk, uh, the Super Bowl ads, like Coinbase uh, doubling its employee count. It's just so so big and like so much money and uh, so much growth. Um, and to be honest. I just it 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 I don't know it seems a little bit um like like the bubble is about to pop like this 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 is the kind of thing you you see kind of like right when things are kind of starting to go awry um and of course like we've seen what the market is doing uh, regulators are are looming um uh, macro conditions are changing. Uh, the Fed is raising rates at the same time that all of these like splashy news are happening. Um, so it just feels like a little bit like, oof, like where where is it going from here? Um, but you know, I think uh, we've said it again and again. Like crypto today is not like crypto 2017. So if this is a bubble and it pops. Um, of course, there's so much real value uh, in, in the crypto space today, so much real adoption. Um, so like institutions are, are here, real users are here, uh, different use cases like NFTs themselves uh, are here to stay. So yeah, just like part of me is like worries that like with all these news, is the bubble popping? But the other side of me is like, well, what if it does? Like crypto is gonna be just fine. Wise words. Elaine, <laughs> final thoughts? I love that. Um, look, I think, you know, Super Bowl now, what's next? So, and I think if you think if the Coinbase advert just crashes, it means a lot of people is still downloading Coinbase for the very first time. So just how go it's going to go? Who knows? Stay tuned. It reminds me of that that cheesy thing that you used to see over people's doors. The world is full of friends we haven't met yet. And maybe we shouldn't meet them, but we can be considered <laughs> your friends as we say <laughs> adios, goodbye, and we'll see you next week for more of the same. <laughs>